All right. Good morning, everybody. This is the 10th episode of Web's Webinar Wednesday. Um, I'm very excited for this another episode. Um, if you're joining us for the first day, uh, for the first time, I need to say, my name is Thijs van Rosmalen. I'm an account executive at Web's. We're a HubSpot agency working for marketing and sales teams. And the past 10 weeks, we are covering marketing and sales topics uh, uh, in these uh, webinar series. If you're joining for the first time, I will explain some easy rules. You're all on mute, but the chat is your biggest friend. So please don't hesitate. Share all your questions in the chat. I will manage those. And um, at the end, so after 40, 45 minutes, we will have enough uh, uh, room to cover all your questions. In the unlikely event that one of your questions is not answered, you can reach out to our keynote speaker of the day or to myself after the webinar. Um, yeah, there is sound. Welcome, Dan. You can hear me. That's good to hear. So that's the chat, guys. Use the chat. Um, another thing, this will be recorded uh, and you will get uh, the recording afterwards. So you can take notes or just listen because it will be a roller coaster ride the next 45 minutes because we have a keynote speaker for today he's maximizing revenues and builds winning sales strategies he's involved with a lot of startups and scale-ups and he helps them to get all the funding and the past months he said yes to only two of many webinar requests so we are very happy that he will join us today Welcome, Mikael Umble. Thank you, Tess. Can you hear me? Just to double check. And I can hear you. Loud perfect. And clear. I will and stop sharing my screen so thank, you're all good to go. Thank you. Good morning, all of you. And I like to be on time, so I've put this little thing here in front of my eyes. So I'll stay within the 45 minutes. You don't need to worry about that. What when people One second, there's some technical issues. Unmute, Sorry. right? Yeah. You there? there we go. Yeah. Uh, okay. I can hear you. So, so when, good morning. So when people meet me the first time and they figure out what they do and they've seen me online on our YouTube channel and all the stuff I'm doing, they always ask me the same two questions. Question number one, it's every day. This morning, somebody phoned me and asked me, is it Michael or is it Michael? Actually, at home, they say Michael. If you do it in English, it's Michael, right? And this question number two, is about always the same thing. Michael, my sales, myself, my team, we are not closing enough. And then I have to look them deep in the eyes and I say, that closing is not gonna be your problem. Your problem will be something else. You either simply do not have the volume in that pipeline to be statistically on the safe side, or you have an issue in the velocity within your deals. So today, although we're going to talk about thought leadership and how to, to build an inbound and flip that to outbound and all the mechanism around it, I will start with something basic and I will go to closing. And something that I seen that when, when I was a vice president of sales and head of global sales, sometimes I got home and then I sit in the sofa and I had this stare. I was, I was tired and the last three years I've been helping so many companies, I've met so many salespeople and I recognized the stare immediately and it took me a long time and I, I found a nice picture for this. I found a nice picture for this. For me, sales is like swimming in that lake of rejection. You get, you get no from morning till evening and then you get home and then your wife says no and then you say to the kids, come here and they say, no, I won't eat those vegetables, right? So we gotta find a way to learn to deal with no. And that was the start, of, the start of my journey three years ago because I was tired of getting the no. And I was thinking, there must be another way, right? There must be another way. But before we go there, let's talk quickly about sales. When I say sales, I think of these guys. I always call them maybe a bit unrespectful, the BM, BMW car sales dealer, right? They look nice, they're pretty, they talk nice. And you have this feeling like something's wrong, right? They're taking too much margin, but this is not completely right. Now, as I've been helping so many startups and scale-ups, I realized that sales doesn't look like this. Sales actually look like this. It's just pure chaos. That's where my company name comes from, automating chaos, chaomatic. 
And, and, and the reason why it scales, it's because we hire these people to say yes. We hire these people because they're fundamentally social. They're outgoing. That's what sales is. And you know what the big problem with that is? Every sales leader complains to me that the sales team never fills in the CRM. It's logical. People, sales, being extremely social, compensate that by being unstructured in their work, right? So it's going to be a battle for the end of days to get the CRM properly filled in. Now, talking about CRM, let's have a quick look at a pipeline. This is a very, very classic pipeline, works for 90%, 95% of all the customers of all the business I've been dealing with, which has several stages going from qualification with all the methodologies, but that's not the goal of this webinar, presenting proposals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The thing I've seen is over the last years is while I was helping all of these scale-ups and some go really fast, others go slower, I started seeing a pattern of a number coming back. And the pattern of the number is that the really good ones, they have a closing rate of qualification to closing of around 13 to 15%. Now that's an intriguing number. And, and the more I started digging, I started figuring out that if you are really good, you can push them up, but it means you're extremely strict on the qualification. So the stricter you are in the beginning, the higher the closing rate actually. But in average, if you do a lot of inbound, but also a lot of cold outbound, so if you mix both, then you get between 30 to 15%. Now that's an intriguing number because if you just look at, for instance, one closed deal, it means you have, need to make three proposals. It means you need to make, you have to have nine deals in qualification, but clearly nobody makes a business plan on, on, on one deal. You make a business plan on, let's add a zero. 10 deals means 30 offers, means 90, nine zero in qualification. Most pipelines that I see, most salespeople that I see forecasting do not have that volume. So it's all fine, fun and games to talk about quality and big deals and all of that. But I also want you to start looking at quality, uh, quantity. One of the things that has been annoying me massively is, is the praise of this quality and everything. They use quality as an excuse to not have quantity. And I really, really have a problem. So I will talk later on about how can you increase quantity? How can you literally add volume to everything that you do? So let's move on beyond the process of the whole sales pipeline and funnel. And let's start talking about the majorly important thing, closing. Now, to understand closing, I need to go one step back. You just seen me explaining a typical structure of a, of a, of a pipeline. And this is the same picture, but then with ugly colors. And I've added marketing in here. So what I've done is basically, sorry, what I've done basically is I've built the entire view of me as a seller towards the world. And I explained that this works for 90 to 95% of the customers. However, yet there is a massive problem. And the problem is that this is not reality. This is what I do as a company. This is what I do as, as a salesman to structure the chaotic world because the world doesn't work in very nice uh, parts. It's erratic it goes from left to right so this is a pure seller centric view to really understand closing i need to go to a buyer's perspective and to understand thought leadership i need to be sitting on the other side and not on the sales side so how do people buy and i know we can spend three weeks doing this and you have lots of agencies they spend their time i'm going to do this in literally one minute i'm aware of a problem i got to fix something very simple i have an agenda my private one my wife has an agenda the family one they're not synchronized I'm already a happy boy because I know the words I'm looking for, agenda synchronization, right? So I go to Google agenda synchronization. And if I don't get a proper answer, I go to the second largest search engine. And that is not Bing, it's YouTube. People look on YouTube completely different. They go, what, how to, etc. So I figure out something, I select the service, I integrate it in life. Now I just said you, told you that life isn't that structured. So this is way too structured. So you'll be thinking, hang on, that's not reality. Exactly. So the last three, four years, what has been happening, and that has been a dramatic change with all of your prospects, the moment you hit a website, the moment you search, what's going to happen is you will be retargeted for the next two weeks. So you will get so much content, so much information around the stuff you're looking for, that although you have found a tool, especially, let's say, SaaS business, you tend to look again at other tools. And what happens is that prospects keep ping-ponging between the education and the selection phase. So then the big metaphorical question, the big 
difficult question to you today is that what's that thing in the middle there? Yeah. And you've got to think deeply about it. What that thing is actually is something very basic because it's just a big, big fat green line. But it does something majorly important. It makes a difference between not selling and selling. I walk into a clothing shop. First thing that happens, this lady jumps on me and says, how can I help you? And I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 hang on. I have no clue, right? So I, five minutes later, I have two shirts in my hand. I'm looking for the lady. She's nowhere to be found. What do we all do wrong? Is if you start looking into the pattern, then all of our websites, 90% of all the websites, of all the communications I see are always geared on the selection part. Hi, I'm the best. These are the future features. This is the product. This is the prizes that I have won. We are fantastic. Any website goes like this. You have a top banner, says, we are fantastic. This is our product. These are the products. These are the features. And in best case, you can subscribe to a newsletter, 25 fields, and then potentially maybe you have a reference. What I'm doing with that is I am on the selection phase. If somebody knows what they want, that's exactly what you need to give them. But most of our customers do not know that. They're actually in the education phase. So we got to make sure that we provide them with the right information, the right tools, the right things, so they can actually make that decision and they will trust you more. And this is pure from a buyer's point of view. Now, let's flip it around. If I want to sell something to you, who do I talk about? I talk about you. I don't talk about me. So salespeople, please, 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 please stop talking about you. Who is the most important person at this stage? It's your prospect. It's them. So we got to go towards them. and We got to stop talking about us. It's as simple as that. So if we really start thinking about it, then we all know that people love to buy. It gives endorphins. It makes us happy. You even have new words, Corona, revenge buying, that kind of stuff. But the people just don't trust sales. They don't trust sales. You see here in the HubSpot research, search and research, we all know they don't trust sales. Yet, we expect as sales management, our salespeople to behave like sales. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to go all wrong, right? Am I saying you should, you should stop doing that? Exactly. I say you got to do something else. If you truly think about it, not selling is the new sales. So we got to find new ways of selling, but in a way more subtle way in a way where we put the prospect the customer actually at first uh, sight so let's go to another topic if we really start thinking about it and we start looking into the world that has problems that looks for solutions and i have a product and i have a i have a, I have a service and i go into the world and i try to sell where do i end i have from the world to closing 2% conversion. And actually, I've seen numbers uh, more and more last months. They go really down. They go to 1.3, 1.4. And the reason for that is very simple. The reason for that is because we keep talking about ourselves. We keep doing the traditional pattern that we've been doing for the last 30, 40 years. What, what all the trainers, if you go out and you look for sales training, you know what they train you? Solution selling. My dear friend, solution selling is 20 years old. You know when solution selling works? Solution selling works when your prospect knows exactly what they want. But most prospects have no clue what they want. They know something's wrong or they don't even know they have a problem. So how do we get to the 98%? That's the big question. To get to the 98%, you have two flavors. Flavor one, they will never buy your shizzle. Never. They don't like you. I have no reason why they just won't buy. The second one is they are not ready to buy. If you, even if you have the worst shitty product in the world with the worst website, like a pink thing with two letters on it, you will still sell. Because if your house is on fire, people, their house is on fire, will still buy the fire extinguisher because they need it, right? The urge is so big. But most of these people, the 98%, they don't need a fire extinguisher straight away. So how does this work? And this slide took me 20 years to come to this very simplistic model. So if we really start thinking about all of what you do, we sell, we offer, we deliver a service or a good that basically, basically unburdens your customer. That's it. We, in essence, sell time. 
if they buy our service, we can do it faster because we have the expertise or maybe our product solves it. Because most companies with their large cash reserves, they could do everything they want whenever they want, but they don't want that. They want you to do it because you offer something exceptional for them. Now, if I gear all my communication on this part, I get, remember, the 2%. So I got to start doing something else. I got to start looking at how do people actually get there? And people, it always starts with the same thing. It always starts with a dream. Now, be careful. The dream for a founder, a co-founder, an executive is different than the dream for somebody working for them. So you actually have layered dreams, depending on where you are in the stage of life, where you are in, in, in the organization. Right? So I'm on a stage, 500 people in front of me. I do this really cool movie, tell a story. I see everybody go oh, wild clapping, of course, right? And taking pictures. And I think I, I've inspired them like crazy. So here is my offer, um, buy services, blah, blah, blah. And I see the room. Wah, 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 wah. And that was an incredible moment for me because I realized I missed something. I truly missed something. And if you go look into your own mind, when you get inspired, when you see a movie, when you go on YouTube, whatever you read, all these books, always the same thing happens. When we see something that we want or think we could achieve, we do one magical step, and it's this one. We go try and figure it out ourselves. Teach me so I can do it myself. And that is an unbelievably powerful, because all of us humans, we think we can do it ourselves. And technically, most of us can right? With enough time, enough money, we could. Now, funnily enough is that if you start providing material to do this, they will be very intrigued. So I started sharing a lot. And actually, I started sharing maybe too much in most people's eyes. And I had people phoning us, are you nuts? Your competition is watching this and all of that. I said, hang on, hang on, hang on. It is not because I share my best idea that they can operationalize it your job your offer is to operationalize it for them but in the meantime while they're watching your content while they're seeing what you do and while you're really truly helping them educating them giving them tools you will become the true expert it will be you when shit happens and corona happens suddenly they will come to you because you if they have to choose where they put the money they're going to put it in you also on top, the people that don't buy, because don't forget, you will have tons of people that will download your stuff and look at your stuff, but don't buy. They become your advocates because if somebody asks them, where should I go? Go to this guy, right? And I told, I'm there. I found the model. Inspire, educate, focus my content there. And I have customers coming to me. And then I forgot something. I forgot something very basic. I forgot we are also human beings. And what you know what human beings like to do? We love to fiddle around with stuff we love to smell we love to touch and then i thought i need to put in a part of experience because it's the experience that makes prospects customers never forget how can you do that you can do that by stage by webinars by nice slides but you can also do that within the sales process we don't have time in this webinar to go there but what i want to to make you really aware you should print this slide put it in front of you all your content as of today, should be inspiring or educational, and it should not be geared on delivery. That's how your website should like that should be, and you'll see that you'll actually triple, quadruple the amount of people that will come to you and say, can you please do this for me, or can I please buy your product? Now, if we start thinking about it, then everything marketing does is attention, because of course, without attention, we, 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 can't, we can't create trust. But then the job of sales changes. It's no longer about attention. It's all about trust. So, so we become way stronger. So now, finally, we're going to get to thought leadership. And I needed this intro so you really understand what's going to come next. Because one of the biggest issues to scale, and I've seen this in startups, scale-ups, I've seen this in very large corporates, the most basic issue all of us have is so basic we don't realize this can be for your personal career, this can be for the company, this can be for lead generation, it can be for everything. The basic, it's so basic, we just forget that nobody knows us, right? If nobody knows your ideas, if nobody knows your expertise, how a nerd can they buy from you? Oh no, I'm gonna do my 40, 50 cold calls and I'm gonna start banging on the door. But then people get to know you in a weird way. You're forcing it, right? There are no shortcuts. I'm not saying you shouldn't do cold calling. No, I think you should first try some other stuff and then 
start doing cold call. So at a certain stage, I get a phone call from a very large company called, I can't say the name, but it rhymes on espresso. And they asked me to come and explain at board level, how on earth should they be dealing with the fact that they have salespeople and other people posting themselves on social? And he said, we don't want that, right? We want to control that. We want to be the company. We want to control that. So how do we deal with this? So the next three slides are coming from that meeting. So if we take a step back and we look from it from a company point of view, companies think like this, I got to protect the brand so that messaging needs to be professional. So if it's professional, there can't be any legal issues and then I need to control it. And control is a word that comes back all the time. And of course, maybe when people start posting, headhunters will come, let me tell you now, headhunters will come anyways, you got to let that go. But the key word here is control. So when I see this as a startup scale-up or any business I'm trying to get into a new, new uh, country, I smile because I know I can be 10 times faster than these guys because by the time they've approved it, I'm already taking market share. Now, you also have a personal aspect. People will think, yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. What about my friends? And how on earth do I balance this private versus work? And, and maybe I'm not a coffee person. I'm a tea person, right? And, and what if I change roles? I'm now a sales. And then tomorrow I become the head of marketing, just saying something. And how on earth am I going to do this workload? I don't want to do this in the evening. I don't want to do four po posts on Instagram every day. It's insane. And you're right. It's insane. So if you think about it, companies have a pure defense approach. So to beat them, you got to be offensive, right? People, they have the scared to shit approach. They think, well, maybe this gets viral, maybe, and they start overthinking all of these things. So how do we, how do we start balancing this? And, and, and what's the difference between personal and, and, and company? So let's take Nespresso. When I say Nespresso, you think of George Clooney, right? You think of really nice, high design branding. So what they did was they basically bought George Clooney, in essence, to put his face on a commercial, very expensive commercial. So what happens is he gets a certain amount of reach. Everybody has seen a uh, publicity, which is a lot paid, and you get some trust. But what will you never do is you will never send the movie of George Clooney to your friends. Or you would say, hey, look at this. You don't do that because you know he's selling you coffee. So you get a limited effect on the network. You get a limited effect on trust, although you might find it beautiful, but it's still limited. And you know it's extremely expensive as a company. So why don't we try something else? Why don't we do something else? Why don't we take 2% of the staff of Nespresso and say, listen, you're all experts in your field. Why don't you share inspirational, educational, pure expertise? What happens is, Jan, for instance, he will have a certain small circle of influence. And then literally, if you start adding all the components, your reach will be way bigger. The trust will be much higher. You will scale more. You will get tons of leads coming in and it's really cheap. So I'm saying to companies, you got to start to let go of some of the control. I'd say you've got to contain it, but you've got to push it. People don't trust companies. And when you think of large companies, by the way, famous companies, Apple, Tesla, all of the stuff that, I mean, just very classic names, you actually think of people, of a name, of a CEO, of somebody. You're not always thinking of the whole brand, right? So I learned this the hard way. I, I, this is a LinkedIn example. I didn't post for two months and I went on LinkedIn and I made a private post, me as a person posting. What was the effect of this? I had, without me mentioning my company, I suddenly, out of nowhere, because I didn't do anything right, I suddenly had 140 people coming to my website. So what I've seen is over the last two years, and I've been helping lots of companies with that, is that if founders, co-founders, salespeople start sharing their expertise, they actually ger generate tons of traffic to the website and they actually generate tons of leads. So there is a direct correlation between you as a person in a company sharing expertise and generating leads. So then the question is, why? Because people buy from people. People trust people. So... To understand how do we scale this, we got to look to classic model, marketing. So everywhere I go, it's always the same thing. They have marketing. And when I say marketing, you think of blogs, writing. So if you want to scale your company, first thing you think, oh, Michael, I got to write a blog. Oh, again, another blog. I get the Google SEO. I get it, right? So what happens is you have a team and they're focused on uh, events, uh, PR, writing, basically producing some of the stuff. They all do it in one team. The thing is, it means it's slow. It also means you can do one or two campaigns per quarter. 
And I figured out something else. The more I was talking to people and the more I was talking to, to startups, scale-ups, even large corporates, I figured out that producing content is not the hard part. Everybody thinks that's the hard part. No, it's not. Because I, if you put a microphone under my nose and you start asking me sales questions, I can't talk for three days. If, any, if I ask any one of you to talk about what you're busy with every day, you can talk for days. So producing content is not the hard part. I'm going to show that later. What is the hard part is the distribution of it. Because distributing has become extremely technical. Growth hacking, SEO, SCR, paid, organic, I mean, all the channels. So what I started learning is that if I start pulling it apart and I focus on one hand creating at scale content, then I need to have somebody or a team that will help me with the distribution. It cannot be the same person because it's just two different people, two different sets of knowledge to be able to do it. Let me give you another example. Let me make it way more painful. I'm a large company, I make a movie. This movie, I made it for YouTube. Let's say this costs somewhere between 10 to 15K, depending how crazy you wanna go. And I set a script, uh, I have to get actors, uh, myself in this case, but I have to build this thing. So it means I can do one per quarter. Now, if I take that same amount, I could do something else. Instead of doing filming this in two, three days and all the edits, in one day, I could do this for the same amount. I could actually produce way more content. If I look at this for the same amount, I have three different types of videos, plus I have 12. That means during a quarter, I will have a video every week. I will know exactly after a month what works, what doesn't work, where I need to put the money, and how to scale, and everybody will have seen it. So no single shot, more a scattergun approach at first to figure out what's going on. So let's go back to content. You have video, written audio. Fastest, by no means, everybody knows audio. I can record myself now, and literally two minutes later, I've distributed on nine podcast platforms. No discussion. The most expensive, you'll all say video. I know for now. It's not true, and I'll show you later. Because video has moving image, still image, audio, and text. Right? So for the, that price, you get four things. What's the slowest? Writing. What's the most expensive for me? Writing. So funnily enough, we all go to writing. So I thought, two years and a half ago, I thought, I'm a lazy man, put a camera on me, let's see what happens. So I started doing video. And the way I did video was the following. I started thinking about this and I just took a date. In four weeks, I phoned up five, six friends, friends, CEOs, and I said, I'm gonna interview you. The reason why I did the interview is very simple. Even if I don't know anything, if I ask you questions, because me asking questions, some of the expertise comes to me, right? That's one. Two, if I stay within the realm of what I know, in this case, sales and marketing, I can actually, without too much preparation, ask 10,000 questions on sales and marketing, right? So I invited, we did uh, in the morning, we did 45 minute slots. I had, uh, uh, I had five guests. And then in the afternoon, I thought, while I'm filming, because starting is hard, but once you get going, you can continue. Why don't I continue? So I started making these three minute movies with questions. I would simply answer questions that my customers would ask. So I went to the Gamma and, uh, you know, like a, like, a, like a store and I bought this, uh, this big uh, carton thing and then I painted it black with, uh, how do you call that? Uh, it's a paint for schools. And you actually see in one of those movies, the paint is still drying. And, and I just recorded 10. So basically in one day, every six weeks or every two months, I have one day that's crazy, crazy production. I make 15 videos, but it means one, I optimize my cost. Two, I have content for 15 weeks, right? And then I thought, can we scale this thing? So then I said, let's try something else. So I make my video, I post a video and three weeks later, I use this app called Anchor, which is bought by Spotify, it's free anchor.fm and I just take the, the file, drop it in there, different visual, which takes me literally two minutes and is distributed on nine podcast platforms. And then I thought, hang on, I have video, I have audio, can't I get text? Well, there's another app called rev.com. There are several ones. This is one I use. For $1 per minute, you get a perfectly transcribed text. So I took the text three weeks later, we take the text, take the picture, put put the podcast, take the, the, the YouTube in there, put it all in there. And I had a blog, an article, 
and I would post it again. And you know what I noticed? Something very weird. People that watch are not the ones that listen. People that listen are not the ones that read. You actually cover three different audiences. So that means my 15 videos become 45 pieces of content. Even in B2B, this works. One day of recording, I have a year of content. Now imagine you start doing that every six to two months. You win. Within the domain, you win. This is the way to beat large corporates. This is the way, if you're a corporate, to scale 10 times faster. Now, question then was, why do people subscribe? Because I started doing YouTube and all of this stuff and I started figuring out and you learn a lot while you go. And then look at this. I just took one example, team leader, you have Belgium, but you have the Netherlands one, this CRM system. And, and look at that. I mean, in the meantime, they have over 400 subscribers, but how come a company like that with very expensive videos, very high quality videos, only has 400 subscribers while I think personnel, they have 300 people. And you know why? Because look at this. They talk about them, about them, about their TV, their stuff. They only talk about them. And let me tell you, nobody gives a fuck. People care about them, their business, their dreams. So why don't you do it? Here's a competitor of them, Closeout.io. This guy makes bad quality movies. He records himself. In the meantime, he's improved. He records himself. But what does he do? He doesn't talk about himself. He talks about how do you win with CRM? What do you need to know? Cold calling, ta, 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 right? So it's a very powerful way to switch. So stop doing this. Even, yeah, I give you a very good example. If you go to the website of AWS, Amazon, if you look at the YouTube that they made, it starts with a show and it's customers talking. And then the next thing, it's all about uh, giving three minute advice, all of that. And only a few steps la later, you'll actually see movies about explaining the product. Guess what has most views? Guess what has most traction? What has most credibility? It's the top part, right? Another something I learned very quickly was that if, if you go out, people get inspired by the, let's say, by the, the higher goal. If I say, I'm there to make you win in sales, that's interesting, but they're more interesting to say, this guy here, value tainment, if you've never seen him, this guy in the last five, six years, he set up a YouTube channel and he only talks about everything that entrepreneurs needs. If you start looking into what he sells, everybody thinks service. And no, this is the largest independent insurance broker in the USA. And why? He didn't talk about insurances. No, he talks about your business. So you trust him and you come and watch what he does. And then you say, I must take insurance from this guy. But this is very weird for companies. I want you to stop doing that heart attack, I want you to go sideways. And in the beginning, you will have a slowdown a bit, but eventually you'll eat the whole market. For me, same thing. People don't watch Michael. People watch the school of sales because they want to learn something. Now, let me take it a few levels further. If we really start thinking about thought leadership models, you need to do a few things. One, you need to have a higher cost. I just explained it to you. Two, you need to polarize, meaning rather black and white. I know for our Dutch colleagues here, because you hear the Flemish accent in here, we're a bit kind of more uh, like, let's more subtle, let's, let's be careful. In the Netherlands, they are kind of in your face, right? So this also creates lots of interesting conflicts in Belgium, but you need to polarize, right? Rather black, white. Three, try and be different. Now, I have to say the following, I wasn't any of those things when I started. I basically said, I'm just going to start two interviews, share my opinion. And as time grew, the quality of the videos grew extremely on top. The way you speak, the way you learn how to phrase, you really, really learn to do this and you get also more confident as you start doing this. So next up, if I had to change one thing, one single thing, I would do something different. One, I would not do it on my face. I would have done it not on Michael Humble. I would have done it on, on a company name or the higher cause. And I would have multiple people in there. So it's, it, it has no limits to scale. Now it's limited to my scale, which you don't want. That's one. Two, you got to start with the end. What that I mean is you have to think, where are my prospects consuming content where is their attention and basically what you do is instead of just recording organically what i've done is you go there and you say i'm going to make for you a video series 
So here's an example of Blovi, which is a Flemish uh, site that, that's into business. They have 90,000 subscriptions. So I went to them and I said, listen, I'm going to make a movie, five movies. You don't, and normally these guys, they charge you for doing ads and campaigns. And I said, no, no, I'll do it for free. And it's going to be very high quality content. So it had the cost to me. However, for five weeks, they posted my content and I had all the attention of their, of their subscribers. And on top, if I look at the cost, actually, it was, compared, it was nothing, right? So I'll give you another example. One day, I phoned our friends from HubSpot, and I said, I want to make a movie for you guys. And they said, who are you? By Mike, humble, humble what? Huh? Um, and I said, no, no, I'm going to make a movie. You have a new product. Uh, I'm going to explain how you do personalized video. So I made the movie, sent it to them, and then the guy said, uh, the guy phoned me back, and he said, yeah, I kind of like the movie, but uh, I want to ask you something. We don't do reach for others. Okay, there goes my plan. But uh, we want to ask you something. Can we have the movie? Can we have it? As in the native file? I go, I no, no way I'm going to give my IP away. I got to be careful here, right? And then I thought, you know what? It's my face all over the place. What can happen? So I said, okay, here's the file. I heard nothing. Two weeks later, guy phones me up and said, we use your movie in a newsletter to 300,000 people. So what I want to tell you is really think about distributing and don't do just 10 movies. I would make like four or five around a team so you can reuse that, right? So everything I'm telling here, you can see on LinkedIn and YouTube, you can really watch what works, what doesn't work, how it evolved. Just, just I believe truly in walking the talk, right? So of course, you've got to share it. I'm not going to spend too much time. Probably you're all experts uh, on it. There are many, many ways of sharing. B2B currently, LinkedIn is still the major one. It's growing the fastest. I like YouTube. Not My prospects are not on YouTube. Be very careful. I have lots of crazy people on there. But for me, it's like a testing ground. And of course, you get the advantage of SEO. What works there, I can then push to other. I've been playing around with Pinterest a lot, actually. For B2B, you can do really magical things there. And that strange logo that maybe you don't know is speakers based. Because if you want to be a thought leader, you need to be on stage, right? So uh, speakers based is a platform where actually speakers are. So what you do is you get an account, you open LinkedIn, copy, paste, tack, and you're suddenly a speaker, right? So that's a good trick. So... I wanted to pause here because lots of you will think now, hang on, Michael, 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 Michael. I don't do video. I'm, not, I'm bad on video. My face, my hair. I'm just too gorgeous to be on video, right? So there are other flows that you can do. Flow number one is you start with audio. Here's an example of Neil Patel in his marketing school. What these guys do once a month, they take a morning and they record 30 podcasts. And the podcast go like that. He phones his buddy and says, hey, my customer phoned me up. That was their problem. How would you solve it? And they just answer it. Podcasts are three minutes, seven minutes, sometimes 20. It doesn't matter. It's short, snackable, really valuable educational content. They take the audio file. They put that on YouTube. And then it becomes a written piece. Alternatively, what we're in here today is a webinar. Webinar, you can have live, then you put the recording, people can leave their email, and after a part, you can chop it into pieces, chop it on YouTube, and then you can make an article from it. So from B2B point, the webinar flow currently is a very good one, but I would still start looking at audio and video. One thing, remember, if you truly want to scale, it's going to be video or audio, because writing is extremely, extremely slow. So let me start wrapping some of this up and let's talk about inbound because if we start making all of this stuff we got to do something with it right so if we really think about it we got to start with what's the dream customer and those dream customers have problems and what you do is most people what i see is they go fishing in the sea but they don't put anything on the hook and then by accident they get a fish and they go like yeah most businesses also i meet are very built organically people came to them and then something happens and they never learn to use outbound so the way to go is to start building bait, the worm on the fish hook for your dream customers. Because if you start fishing with the right bait, they will come. It's as simple as that. So the content I explained how to build a production machine just before, you got to build bait for the prospects that you want. And then you will actually be able to sell your solution because they'll ask you. Right. So what I love to do is to build an organic model where a lot of people will actually 
come to you and then the thing that works the best i will take that and that i will push into outbound that i will take and i will go with my sales i will do it on linkedin i will phone it doesn't matter because i know it will work it's the ultimate bait so before we go there a few more things uh, I, I had to learn some hard lessons. For instance here, sales directors. A lot of you are sales directors, right? So if I try to sell to a sales director, I know they have three problems. Closing, they always ask me. That's why I started by saying that. Pricing strategy, sales presentation. I thought closing is the major issue. Everybody talks to me about it. But I made three movies about it. And what did I realize? People don't go for the closing movie. They go for the sales presentations movie. And the reason for that is simple because it seems a fast and quick solution to a more complex problem, which is closing. So in order to really understand is what we gotta do is, we gotta, when you know this is the problem or are pretty sure it's a problem, we gotta shoot around it because people will sometimes enter your funnels and will come to you, not for the main problem, but for the problems around it, right? So that's been one of the big learnings. In the meantime, that movie is around 50K views and it just keeps going and keeps going. Now, how do we layer it then? Because value, basically you're giving value. Va value cannot be built in, into, into one movie, into one something you create. No, you have to layer it. And we don't have time today to go into full detail, but here is an example how to layer it on a website, right? You would put different types of bait, and the thing you always need to know to win is if, I, if somebody fills in a survey or, or downloads a use case, you always need to know the next step. Because here is, I hope you're still really listening because I'm gonna tell you the most important sales tip forever. Always, always give choice. Because if I phone you up and I try to sell something to you, even in the most subtle way, if you say now is not the time, now is not the moment, no, I'm not gonna do it. If I put down the phone, they're gone. That's what I keep seeing every time. I'm saying you're all, don't forget, you will close two, 3%, right? You have all these people around, they're not ready to buy. They don't know you, they don't trust you, nothing's burning. So what we gotta do is we gotta keep them close to us. So what we do is we're gonna offer choice, always choice. One is buy, try, smell at it, all that stuff. And the other is, here is something that you can use to build your business. Here is something that can generate revenue. Here is something that can help you, right? Everything you see here, is based on that. The moment they say, I'm not gonna buy, but I'm gonna download whatever I, I, that can help my business, I have them because I know I'm gonna send them the next one and the next one and the next one. And eventually they will say, this is the company I wanna work with, right? Always be upside. Of course, if you wanna try it, this is an example what I do in large audiences to get attraction is to say, listen, here is a model. The model itself of whatever you do, the canvas is, valuable content, right? So when you download this term, what I see is a lot of companies I enter, they have this on the wall and it's plastered with post-its and all of that. And at a certain stage, they say, hey, Michael, come here because we're stuck, right? So this type of techniques, you've got to enter into everything. This is part of the experience. I bring it along to sales meeting. I will actually show that. Right? So I wanted to show you one example, what you could do on pricing, combining value letters and all of that, right? I still have three more minutes to go, so I'm still on time. So I wanted to sell my house. So what I did was I phoned up a um, real estate broker. Real estate broker came, had a nice Porsche Panamera. I looked at him and I thought, it's gonna cost me money, right? So the guy walks in, he says, it's gonna cost 3% to sell the house. And I, I go like, hey, hang on, what do you know about ads? What do you know about marketing? I'm Mr. Sales Guru, you know, I, I did, uh, ooh, uh, and uh, the guy said, oh, no problem. He didn't even argue. He just said, I'm gonna give, do it for 2%. And I'm thinking, the guy walks out and I'm thinking, hang on, if I would be his boss, without any argument, he drops his price. I don't want that, that's not good. How can we fix this? So I phoned up another real estate broker. Guy came in, exactly the same. I thought maybe it's the guys, let's phone a girl. Girl comes in, exactly the same. And then one day I phone these guys and they come in and this guy says to me, I, he says the whole story and I go and he says 3%. I go with my ho, 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 ho. And he says, Michael, I think it's a great idea that you sell your own house. Uh, what? Yeah. I said, but, but in order to help you, we made a package that actually has all the templates, all the frameworks that we guarantee you will make you more money. So you know what I did? 
I bought the bloody package. I bought the bronze because I wanted to be sure, right? And then after two weeks, my wife said to me, Michael, did you, um, where are we on the house? And I said, yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah, well, you, you know, lots of excuses, didn't do it. So you know what my big problem was? Time. So what happened is this guy phoned me up and he says, hey, Michael, I haven't seen your, uh, your, your house somewhere. And I said, yeah, I don't have time. And then I said, you know what? Why don't you do it for me? This company grew 600% last year in an established market. They offer a product nobody does and they say, do it yourself. So they tapped into a massive opportunity which brings them lots of money. Secondly, the upsell ratio from there to the 3% is 70%, seven zero without giving discount. This my friends is a perfect mix as a value add. So, a few more tactics. I told you always give choice. HubSpot is a perfect example. They'll always give you, try the product. Here is something to learn. Uh, another thing that I've seen is when these people then come to your website, add some CTAs that work, not talk to the expert, get a demo. No, that's talking about you. No, here, I want to make an impact. I want to be a leader. That's CTAs that you click on. Or why don't you do this? I also have a video agency where we do a lot of this thought leadership. And we actually put on the website at a certain stage, I thought, so if somebody's looking for video, they'll arrive to the website. Why don't we do this? Send us your competitor's video. We will show you how to beat them. If somebody fills that in, I know exactly where they are, right? And by the way, people fill this in like crazy. And then the click, teach me how to win. Now, let me start wrapping up. Perfect on time. I want you to buy your own name as a URL today, now, because you gotta have that piece of land, right? I, there's a lot of growth hacking techniques how to steal, but I want you to buy own your own name because you will need to blend personal with company content, right? So if we wanna build a sales engine, everything I talked today, today was a mix between two things. One, everything is marketing fuel. You gotta find a way to scale the production and distribution of content, inspirational and educational content. The whole goal of this is to get to a conversation where you have to infuse them with hunger and say, why should you buy it now, right? You need it now because otherwise something's gonna happen. You gotta light the house on fire. And then you get to the sales machine and sales machine is about pipeline velocity. We didn't talk a lot, a lot about that today, but that's where you take the deal from A to Z and that's sitting in the value prop and the way you do that. So if you wanna know a lot more, check out all the stuff I do, connect to me on LinkedIn, check out uh, the, the website, check out YouTube. It's better that I fail because I do a lot of experiments than that you fail. And whatever works, you just copy, paste, change the words, off you go. Please start focusing also on quantity and scaling yourself, scaling the machine. And I'm absolutely confident if you would be doing that, it's going to be you driving this boat on the lake of rejection. And then I have one more thing before we open the questions and you can ask everything you want. One more thing before you go. May the sales be with you. So, Tess. Nice, nice, nice. May the sales be with you. Thank you, Michael. Um, we got some questions coming in, so uh, let's answer them. Uh, we have another, <clears throat> let's double check, seven minutes in order to get all these things covered. So if you have any questions, again, use the uh, uh, chat uh, and please share anything you want. First question, Michael. Um, Maarten, hi Maarten. He is joining us today and he is wondering if sales should work on trust, but only 11% of customers trust salespersons, this look like a tough job. So it is a tough job. Why are it, we starting? You know, yeah. like, so, <laughs> can we win this? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the stuff I've been explaining to you is how can you scale trust? And the way to scale trust is not to act as a salesperson. Mm -hmm. That's one. Two, every content I post, I'm never, I mean, I'm never really truly selling, right? I'm always helping them grow their business or I'm always sharing. So, you got to think about inspiration and education. If you just would on LinkedIn, as a LinkedIn strategy, for instance, do one post per week and you just answer questions of your customer, you will get 10 times more trust and you will actually get 10 times more leads eventually, right? So you got you to gotta move away from the classic me, 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 we're fantastic, nobody cares. You got to really move into 
this is your pro this is a problem talk about it and then you got to make the problem bigger actually in order to sell faster i mean this is a short answer for a complex question by the way yeah <laughs> so but we're talking competences here so emil yeah. is asking what kind of competences does uh, uh sales or uh, and marketing people really need in order to win this yeah it it, it depends first of all b2c b2b right let's so talk let's, b2b let's let's talk let's, B2B. let's 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 do b2b I think that uh, the best competence that, that you need to have, so if I hire people, I want them to be very coachable. That's very important too. I want to see how they act under pressure, by the way, but this is more, I think, three. I want them to, to present to me. I mean, sales need to be able to express and formulate a value proposition, and I want them to listen and then formulate that value proposition in the context of the customer and not be this classic sales guy that comes in, you know, bragging i'm the best guy da, da, da. i i killed him immediately it doesn't work not now it just doesn't work anymore right and also one of the things i started checking is social skills as in online social skills can they are they not saying crazy stuff online or, or, or do they already have been playing around with linkedin and instagram do they get a feeling because the future of sales is going to be a blend between personal and scaling yourself on social right there is no other way you see the technology, all the technology is going there, right? How, yeah. can you, how can you funnel better? How can you remove? How can you be smarter? So the thing I hope to push today is how can you yourself produce content? That's where it starts. And the most easy is you are an expert. Talk about your expertise. Don't sell. Two, um, answer questions of customers. It's an unlimited amount of content they will produce. Yeah. Right? easy way to get answers and then spread them because if one person has, has that question, yeah. a lot more people and will have that question. We, we, I knew we had this webinar today and I was, I'm writing a book, nobody knows you, all of that. So I did as an experiment because I wanted to see the impact. Why don't you, some, I think we are overthinking a lot of these things. Why don't we ask the public, why don't we ask the people what they think? So I just said, here are two book covers, what do you want? It's ridiculous how, how many people answer that question because they want to help. So if you build it up by sharing, you can ask sometimes and, and people will come back to you. I, I didn't ask to buy, right? I just said, what do you think? You could ask as a sales, I tried this pitch. How should I do it differently in that market? And you know what? People in that market will actually tell you. It's crazy, but people are afraid to do that. And change always comes with a, some sort of resistance. So yeah, yeah, sure. um, isn't it very hard to change old behavior into new uh, uh, behavior? Another question yeah. from so Emil. Let me give you a secret. The ultimate killer to production is perfection. So every time when I give training on helping people, I have to really push them through the glass barrier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you have to find a way where you are not afraid to push the button. That's one. Go. Try. So you're, you're, all of you are overthinking a lot of the things you're doing. You are by nature experts, share that. Go where you are most comfortable, but build a machine. Meaning when I do this, when I get in the flow, I will write 10 posts, right? They're not perfect. But what I do then every week, I will take one and I will tune it, see? So I will take one day of filming. I will do one day of 20 podcasts, webinars I can't get combined, but, but get a rhythm. For instance, I will always have a Tuesday and a Wednesday and it's become a machine. And by the way, all of you, I do all of this alone. I'm alone. Chaomatic is alone. I have some other companies. So nobody has an excuse that they do not have time to do this because I have so much other stuff. On top, I do this, right? So it is perfectly possible to scale yourself. Um, I basically gave you the blueprint today, right? That's yeah, the yeah, blueprint. You did. Just you read did. it. Yeah, yeah, huh? yeah. Okay. Um, two, two, two more questions um, um, uh, in, in line with this answer. Um, just go and start. But how do you tackle like personal fears of insecurities in, in doing this? Like how, yeah. how do you <laughs> so, so with that? Have somebody watching over your shoulder and pushing you and kicking your ass. So when Inside I help customers sometimes, I write, I write together with them. And I say, give it to me and I'll do the first two posts so they're secure. And then they go like, oh, this works. And then it's rhythm. And I cannot, you got to get the rhythm. So in my agenda is a block mm -hmm. post and I, I will, whatever happens, I've learned. The, the one difference between me and lots of other people is I've been crazy consistent. 
And sometimes it's nothing, eh? because I tell you, the first three times you all will post, you will have lots of likes. It's all your friends, it's your family. My mother mobilized all our friends in the beginning, right? <laughs> but they get bored of you after four or five weeks. So when you start to do me one favor, keep it up for six weeks, but only after five to six weeks, you will see the true prospect, the one you want, starting to trust you. And there is no shortcut. Okay, cool. I um, last question for today. We can go on for ages and I really like this, but um, uh, there is a question because you mentioned it very shortly in your presentation um, that you have a B2B strategy for Pinterest. Yeah. Could you share some of that secret? So uh, very brief. So w w why do people come to Pinterest? The way I learned is I was building a house. I needed a new bathroom. Start watching. I'm doing something in the garden. Start watching. And then I started figuring out a lot of people that are actually there are also business people. And what they love to watch is infographics, but they love to also watch these like four steps to do something. So the concept of a canvas, the stuff I showed you works extremely well on Pinterest, right? And you, what works well is hashtags, all of this stuff works very nice. And because it's underused, if you want to put some ads behind it, it's incredibly cheap for massive amounts of reach. So I would definitely as a B2B, while you're in the flow, you make the mini guide, the canvas, the movie, just put them on Pinterest, see what happens. It's crazy how people will actually start following. I mean, I had months with 200,000 views on stuff where I go like, where the hell does this come from, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a very intriguing one. It's a very visual one. And movies work really well because you have the movie, you can put it, you can put it yeah. in there if you want to. And try to pilot it as a new... Yeah. Um... Just test, test. I, I test a lot of these tests. The one thing that yeah. doesn't work for me, I tell you now, I'll be honest, TikTok, <laughs> I suck at it horribly. Right. That was the last one on my list. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, okay. it, just, it just doesn't work for me. But okay. I think also you got to pick two battles. Yeah, you can't yeah. pick 20. So I do experiments. My battle is simple. It's LinkedIn. I tried a lot of Facebook. For me, it didn't really work. Uh, so now I'm doing a lot of Instagram just to see. But it's very different. It's very, it's more personal. I, 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 I mean, just stick to two and the rest, let it go. Nice. Um, again, uh, some people are leaving. So I want to take, uh, um, I will have the respect for everybody's calendar. We will finish this up uh, right now. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Again, the recording will be shared so you can watch it later or send it to your friends and colleagues uh, because it was very inspiring, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let me end with saying that next week we will have another expert in our 11th series. It will be one in the afternoon because we will have somebody joining from the US. His name is Luke Sommerfield. Uh, he's one of my friends from HubSpot and he will explain anything about everything, sorry, about the uh, new HubSpot CMS, how to manage your website within HubSpot. So um, a great product uh, uh, um, episode. Next week, again, Michael, thank you, thank you so much and I uh, hope to see everybody next week again. Bye-bye.